Okay. Welcome to the webinar. Today we are going to present benchmarking your food safety training program with Dr. Bob Strong. Dr. Bob Strong has 45 years of experience in the food industry. He has a PhD and BSc in chemistry, and he works with us as an instructor, lead auditor training, and is also certified to consult on the GFSI. He's certified in 21 SQF product categories, and now I'll leave you with Dr. Bob. Well, thank you, Adriana. The first thing I think we would like to do before we get started is, can you do a little bit of a poll question here about uh, what is the greatest challenges that people face conducting their food safety training? So Adriana's opened up the poll now. If you will uh, basically select one of the five answers below so I can get a feel for exactly whether you feel scheduling time for training is your biggest challenge or verifying that your employees are trained effectively, or getting management to even commit to training, or whether you've got language challenges because your workforce is multilingual, or do you have budget constraints? So let us know, uh, Adriana, when the polls closed out. Give everybody maybe another 10 or 15 seconds. All right, Adriana, what type of uh, answers do we get to that poll? Here can they you, are. Can you read them to us? Sure. Uh, okay, so 51% prefers verifying that the training was effective. 23% is scheduling time for training. And 12% management commitment. All right, well, that's good. That means that uh, budgets and language challenges are not, but uh, very fine that training is effective is very important because we've now got the regulators asking you to prove to the regulators that training was effective. So what we're gonna be talking about is how do you handle these biggest challenges? How do you get that time to do the training and you're gonna do it internally or externally? How often are you gonna do the training? What are the requirements by law or by GFSI? How do you make sure that key employees are trained to do what they're supposed to do in their job? Do you train to quality and food safety versus just to food safety? And then key to what most of you said was your biggest challenge, measuring the effectiveness. So what are you trying to achieve with your training program? That's where I wanna start off. And I thank you for joining me again today. So before commencing training, you have to decide what you're going to train on. Obviously, you've got to train all your employees and regulatory requirements, whether it's CFIA, USDA, FDA. You only need to train them in GFSI if you're going to be GFSI certified, but then certainly you have to train them against GFSI. You have to train them against your customer requirements if your customers have things over and above what regulators require and what GFSI requires, which quite often are quality requirements that your customers have. You may have particularly requirements for your facility. You may have things that corporate says corporate wants you to do because they're part of your corporate food safety culture. So these are the things you have to decide before you even set up your training programs. Then you have to say exactly what we were saying before, is management going to limit you or maybe not be committed? So how much time are they gonna give you to train your hourly employees? How much can they absorb in one session? Because you can't have them sit there for hours on end like you would if you were a supervisor or a management person where you may go to training and the training may last a day, may last two days. This is not the type of training you can do with hourly employees. One, you can't afford them to take that amount of time away from their position. And secondly, I'm not sure they're going to be able to sit and absorb all that if you're gonna teach them for more than a, maybe half hour, an hour. If you're gonna do supervisors training, 
Then if you're going to do it at your facility, what commonly happens is they get pulled away because something's happening on the floor. So is that going to be effective? How do you do onboarding when you hire new employees? Companies are now starting to use outside placement agencies to get that done before the employee even shows up the first day for work. But then you have to make sure that outside agency is, is qualified to train in what you need to train your employees in. What do you do for refresher training? And how often are you going to do it? We're going to talk about that. Determine the effectiveness of the delivery of the training, not the effectiveness of the training to the employees, but how effective was the training that was delivered to them? Because if it wasn't delivered to them so they understood, wasn't delivered to them in a language they understood, wasn't in, delivered to them in, in words that they understand, then the chances are it's not going to be very effective to start with. So who do you use? Do you use human resources, HR? Do you use the QA supervisor or the QA manager? Or do you use your individual supervisors and let them train their own employees? Now, that could be good, that could be bad. The question is, how qualified is the instructor? How knowledgeable is the instructor in the materials? And can you be a trainer just because you know things? No, not everybody makes a good trainer. So sometimes you may want to bring in an expert from outside, a trainer who's very knowledgeable and can get the word across to your employees. Sometimes people listen to people on the outside, even though they're saying the same thing that you're saying on the inside. If you've got corporate trainers, maybe that's a way to do it. Have corporate come and train your employees. You can now do online e-learning classes. They have an upside and a downside. The upside is they can do them any time. They can stop them usually. They can start them. And you can do it in little sections. The trouble is there's nobody to talk to at the other end. And so therefore you have to value or not value how much the employees are going to get out of that. We do e-learning, so we have that ability as well. So how about another poll, Adriana? This time, hey, let's open up the poll and have people answer the question, how often do you do training? Do you do it right now once a year, twice a year, when a new employee arrives, and when a standard is updated? We'll give you a few seconds, maybe a minute or so to answer that question. We'll see again who's on the line and what type of answers we get here. So I'd leave it open for maybe about another 25 seconds. We're gonna talk a minute about how often you should do the training, but I wanna get a feel for how often you do the training right now. All right, five more seconds. So Adriana, will you close out the poll and give us the percentages, please? Can you read them to us? Yes, sure. So 49% uh, trains once a year, 25% when a new employee arrives, and between 12 and 14% twice a year or when the standard is updated. All right, what I'm surprised is that everybody didn't say 100% when their new employee arrives because that is one of the requirements under the regulations, the government regulations and under GFSI, that employees are trained before they are put out on the floor. So therefore, when they arrive for their first day, you need to be training them then before you turn them on the floor versus I'm going to put them out on the floor and then we'll get to training later. So how do you afford the time? And it takes time to train. And how you, can you successfully allocate costs of that training? Because even if it's just lost production time, there is a cost in training. If you're gonna bring in outside people to do the training, there's a cost of that. If your people are gonna to have to travel, mainly supervisors and management, you've got the cost of that. So let's talk about where you have to do it, but it's not an option. The FDA requires the seafood HACCP, juice HACCP, and low acid canning, that somebody in your facility is trained in those if you are handling those type of products. Whether you're making those products or whether you're storing those products, 
in the case of seafood hassle. USDA and CFIA required it for meat and poultry hassle. FDA recommends it, but doesn't mandate it for preventing control for human and animal foods and for produce safety. But I would, I would make it a strong recommendation. FDA re recommends it for food defense, which goes into effect in July of this year. They call it an intentional adulteration, but it's really food defense. And you have to have somebody in your facility trained in that by July of this year. The FDA requires it for drivers under the Sanitary Transportation Act. And we'll talk about what that means later, but you have to have drivers have to have some training if they're driving trucks that have refrigerated product, and they have to have a little bit more training if they're driving trucks that have produce in them. GFSI requires HACCP, internal auditor, crisis management training. And so these are requirements, and some of them are legal, meaning the law, and some of them are due to the fact that you've got GFSI. So why is training essential? Well, you've got to be able to demonstrate to the regulators and to your GFSI auditor that the training was completed and you have records to prove it. So therefore, you've got to have names of people, you've got to have what you trained them in, you've got to have dates in which you trained them, and you've got to be able to show that to whoever asks when there's GFSI order regulator. Regulator can actually take copies of them away with them. FDA gives require that you demonstrate their employees are competent. And you need to therefore be able to say, how do you know that when they were trained, they actually knew what they were doing, that they were competent to do the tasks that they have to do for you. And the FDA is only interested in food safety. GFSI is only interested in food safety unless you do BRC and IFS and they have quality in there. So if you're not going to go with quality for SQF or FSSC 22,000 as an option, then nobody's going to be asking you for training on quality. At the minimum, what does the FDA say that training has to include? The minimum is the health and hygiene of all your employees when they're working with exposed foods. After that, you're going to train them in allergens, you're going to train them in food defense, you're going to train them in the GMPs, but the minimum has to be their personal how, hygiene and health. And you've got to have records to prove that. You've also got to make sure your employees, when they get questioned by a regulator, can now tell the regulator what type of training they had, why was that training important, and what would be the consequences if they didn't, let's say, wash their hands. So practice that with your employees because that's the type of question they're likely to get from a regulator. And it's not a good time to find out that they don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> Excuse me. So when you're allocating time to conduct training, who are you training? Management, personal, or hourly employees? Is travel required to, in order to complete the training? Or can you deliver it in-house? Will the training impact operations? Yes, if you're going to do it in-house and you're pulling the employees off the line, it's going to impact operations because while they're off the line, you're not going to be making anything, moving anything, shipping anything, receiving anything. And so you have to look into what impact does 